welcome to the show. I'm Antisocial. And this is the Antisocial Network. I want to talk to her, but I, my face is up against the wall. This week, I'm telling you about the myth of gentrifying thrift stores and how the real monster has always, and will always, be capitalism. Thanks for tuning in! segment on NPR last week about the gentrification of thrifting, and I thought, wow, maybe this is something I could do a podcast episode about. I had previously heard this idea about overbuying from thrift stores and reselling thrifted clothing being harmful to the poor people who actually need access to affordable clothing, and so I thought this might be a perfect topic to cover. Plus, I like to feel pious and better than everyone, like most liberals. So if I could prove somehow that using Etsy and Depop made you a bad ally, then hey, I was on board. When I suggested this topic to a friend who is both into fashion and sustainability, she scoffed at the idea that gentrifying thrift stores is even a problem. Yeah, but it leaves less quality options for people who are actually poor and results in raised prices for the items that are available to them, I offered. But she still refused to buy into the idea that this is a legitimate problem. Fast fashion is the problem, she told me, not moms reselling items on Etsy to women who would otherwise be shopping at Banana Republic. Considering this, I decided to look into it. And my friend was right. When I did look into it, NPR has actually done several pieces in the past about how thrift stores have too much stuff, including a recent segment on wish cycling called Thrift Stores Don't Want Your Broken Toaster. So which is it? Are we gentrifying and overshopping these stores, which reportedly also have way too much inventory, or is it something else at play here? Turns out, after minimal research, it seems like all the articles and journalists hopping on the anti-thrifting bandwagon are omitting huge contributing factors to this phenomenon, like fast fashion, a predatory garment industry, and capitalism. I read one article titled simply, Thrift Reselling is Unethical, which left out much of what actually causes this so-called problem. Placing blame on fashionistas with a keen eye for brand names and a good deal without calling out an industry that exploits labor and overproduces cheap and disposable garments is not only lazy reporting, it's irresponsible. Mae Broughton, however, sheds light on this fallacy in an article she wrote in 2020 titled, Thrift Store Gentrification is a Symptom of a Broken Clothing Industry. Broughton explains, this notion of the Depop reseller evokes a stereotype depicting something like this. A conventionally attractive, slim, teenage girl, a businesswoman in the making, simultaneously managing sales and cultivating her brand. She's the epitome of cool, today's youth equivalent to our 2014 Tumblr era Acacia Brindley. Yet, as campy as this image may be, sellers like these are the ones Depop critics take issue with, claiming that this buy and resell business model leads to the gentrification of thrift stores. Other sources I found echoed this sentiment. A Jezebel article from April 30th of this year titled The Complicated Reality of Thrift Store Gentrification explained that there's a trend of TikTokers pointing accusatory fingers at resellers who jack up the prices of used clothing online. One user named Fius the Fetus scolded these types of thrifters on his channel, saying, When you yuppie scalpers fill up your shopping carts, you fuck over the lower class. There is a misguided perception that because of this new influx of online resellers, thrift store supplies have been diminished, causing a rise in demand, resulting in increased prices across the board at all thrift stores, thus hurting the poor people who need to shop there. But that's just not true. Never mind the fact that literally all of the people I have heard making this argument seem to be middle-class white people who also probably don't need to be shopping at Goodwill, let's just look at some data. According to May Broughton's research, in the United States, only 20%, a relatively small portion, of used clothing winds up in secondhand stores, and, according to the EPA, 85%, 
or 12 million tons of thrift store donations are shipped to landfills annually, accounting for 7% of the nation's landfill waste. Broughton points out that not only do most thrift stores accept only about 20% of used clothing donations, but also that we must remember those donations come to them for free. Big thrift stores like Goodwill and Salvation Army have no shortage of inventory, which means they are not subjected to the normal laws of supply and demand. In addition to that, they are charity organizations. With a limitless supply of inventory that they get for free, there is literally no need for them to raise prices on anything ever. You finding a rad vintage denim Levi's jacket for $4 and reselling it on Etsy for $100 is not keeping jackets off of the needy, and it's not preventing Goodwill from paying their overhead. Additionally, there has been criticism of so-called thrift flippers, people who deliberately buy extra-large garments with the intentions of altering them into smaller fitted ones. The problem being that these modern-day seamstresses are diminishing an already small pool of clothing accessible to large shoppers who have a hard enough time finding vintage items in their size as it is. But again, that's Goodwill's fault they're not putting large clothing on the racks, not consumers. Why do thrift stores have so much inventory in the first place? How can they turn so much away? It's not simply that the donations are unsellable, it's literally that they have too much. And it's because of fast fashion. According to data collected by Huffington Post, the world consumes 80 billion articles of new clothing per year, and the average American generates 82 pounds of textile waste each year alone. We wear fast fashion clothing items less than five times and own them on average only 35 days before discarding them. Many factory workers work in dangerous conditions and are not paid a living wage, and yes, some are children. The global clothing industry is the second highest polluter of clean water. The global cotton industry uses more pesticides than any other crop in the world. Fossil fuels are used to make polyester, which takes hundreds of years to break down. Over 70 million trees are cut down every year and turned into fabrics like rayon, while coal burned to operate those factories pollutes the air. Meanwhile, toxic runoff from those factories makes rivers too dangerous for human contact. The garment industry should never have been allowed to create so much disposable inventory using the slave labor that they did. But the fashion industry brings in $1.2 trillion a year, $250 billion from the U.S. alone. So who cares if some people are exploited and the planet dies so we can have disposable underwear, right? Increasingly, dropshippers have become a problem and taken over online retailers. Essentially, dropshipping is a form of outsourcing, which has provided many creators and online shop owners the ability to turn their designs into reality. Many people also use them to produce their merch. Podcasters, for example. Dropshippers are a third party who can handle producing, packaging, and shipping your items, and are often overseas. This creates ambiguity about the ethicality of items you may be buying online, and thrifting from resellers can alleviate that concern. Let's go back to Broughton's example of stereotypical Depop reseller, a young aspiring businesswoman who is the epitome of cool. Considering we already live in a society where women are vilified, it seems a little too convenient for me that we're slapping a label on these thrift store Karens and calling it a day. After all, if a bunch of GameStop gate types found a way to do this first, we'd be calling them entrepreneurs and visionaries. And by GameStop types, I mean men. I don't want to discount the fact that gentrification is a real problem, and white feminism fails to include intersectional voices all the time, and frankly, it's really easy to look at this thrift store reselling thing and see a bunch of wine moms with money who are missing the mark. In a North Texas Daily piece titled, Thrift Reselling is Unethical, Vanessa Delgado wrote that thrifting is not wrong, but profiting off something that people need in order to maintain their standard of living is. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I think there's an inherent defense of capitalism and the systems that oppress us, so it's not surprising that people are blaming trendy TikTokers instead of the system that created fast fashion. But I also think there's a lot of underlying sexism that's happening because often the people who are successful at this whole thrift reselling thing are women. While Broughton describes the quintessential thrifter as a young and hip Depop reseller, most of the people I know who have gotten into reselling thrifted clothes are adult women with children i.e. moms. Whether it's an aspiring adolescent businesswoman or a full-grown mother, both face the same scrutiny. We live in a society that not only pays women less and pushes them out of the workforce the second they become pregnant, but wealth inequality continues to increase, forcing many of us to monetize our hobbies and search for side hustles. For many women who have been successful at it, reselling thrifted clothes has become a flexible and reliable source of income they can do from home. 
That is something that offers an amazing amount of freedom and security that most women can't afford not to take advantage of. Plus, like my friend pointed out to me, most people who are buying marked up vintage clothes are people who would not normally be shopping at a thrift store to begin with. They are making that purchase in lieu of buying something new. In that way, these thrift resellers, while yes, making a profit, are still providing a sustainable alternative to people who otherwise would not be buying used clothing. In addition, finding items, taking photos, listing them, responding to inquiries, packing and shipping items, that's all work. And shouldn't that work be worthy of an increased markup? Most people who are going to pay $100 for a one-of-a-kind item online are more than happy to pay that price for an item they've been unable to find otherwise. It's a symbiotic relationship. Before I continue, let's go to break real quick. Hello, comrades! If you often get accused of hostile, militant behavior when you're just trying to get to work, we may have the answer for you. Soup for Your Family is the perfect solution to ward off fascists, bootlickers, and their sympathizers. If you are constantly harassed and bullied by the state while merely trying to fight for the rights of the proletariat, we see you. Soup for Your Family is a great way to not only feed your family, but it serves as a silent signal to like-minded comrades that you stand with them in the fight against fascism. Whether you're eating it or throwing it in an act of solidarity, Soup for Your Family will never let you down. Brought to you by artisan baristas kidnapped from the southernmost regions of Seattle and transported to your local Amazon hub locker, one coffee bean is all you need is the answer to all your sustainability, fair trade, expensive coffee habit, why is your spouse leaving you, you probably have codependency issues, problems. One coffee bean is all you need is not a coffee system. There are no wasteful cups to continuously buy. There's no coffee shop lines you have to deal with. Just one single bean. First, just pop that little bad boy right in your kisser. Masticate thoroughly, then relocate bean bits to your freedom press. Use boiling water and press as usual. When finished, relocate damp bean bits to a moist paper towel. Repeat process until your next bean arrives in 364 days. It's that easy! One coffee bean is all you need. Also makes a great mother Day present or Flag Day gift for your boss. Don't forget your gynecologist at Labor Day. Welcome back. Initially, I understood the concern people have about gentrifying thrift stores. My father likes to go to his local library's book sale twice a year, and every year there are more and more resellers who are not looking for a rare copy by their favorite author to add to their collection, but rather elbow their way through the crowd and use their phones to scan barcodes and discern a book's worthiness. A lifelong poet, author, and English teacher, this is an insult to my father, who truly is looking for a gem of a book to take home and enjoy. He always argues that locals with a resident ID should get first dibs to pick over the library book sale, and I think he's probably right. But the library doesn't have infinite inventory, and unlike the housing market or commercial retail space, which are affected by the economy and supply and demand, Thrift stores have an unending supply of free inventory. While I understand the concern that trendy resellers are choking the market, it's just not true. Larry Mantle, in the Air Talk piece I heard on NPR, asked one of his guests, does it really matter if the resellers are buying clothes to mark them up if they're buying them from a charity like Goodwill? Doesn't all the money go to the charity anyway? But it was revealed that over time, these charities have moved away from direct giving and more towards action that involves trying to provide jobs for the marginalized. And this has led to an atmosphere of delineating who is, quote, the deserving poor and who is not. Many of these large thrift stores raise money not only to help people in need, but to fund other arms of their charitable organization, or in other words, proselytizing. Basically, direct giving has gone out of fashion. Some people may think that diminishing supplies of trendy or name brand items in charitable thrift shops due to resellers is not a problem because the money used to buy the clothes is going to charity anyway. But since charitable thrift stores like Goodwill and Salvation Army are directly giving less and less, it has become an increasing problem for people actually facing economic insecurity. But not for the reasons people think. Marginalized communities have been negatively affected by thrift giants 
choice to not only raise prices, but donate less to their communities in other ways they had previously. This is not consumers' fault, poor or otherwise. This is squarely on big businesses who are taking advantage of poor people under the guise of charity. Because, let's face it, despite what the articles out there say, people who are buying and reselling thrifted clothes may not be poor, but they're not affluent either. People who have been forced to monetize every aspect of their life and find any way to make a quick buck that doesn't break their back are only doing what they need to in order to survive in a society that requires of us that we work 24-7. These resellers are a product of their environment, and it's not their fault they live in a post-apocalyptic hellscape after decades of fast fashion has ravaged our stores and sensibilities. Is it a 19-year-old Depop seller's fault that Forever 21 exists? Sarah, a teenager who sells on Depop, lamented to Vox in an article from April of this year titled How Thrifting Became Problematic, the fact that she is scrutinized for something she thinks is fun and enjoys doing, while the real culprits responsible for harmful business practices in the fashion industry are not. My shop is a one-person operation, and I love thrifting, photographing the clothes, and selling them as a hobby, Sarah said. I wish there were more constructive conversations about buying from Amazon or fast fashion retailers like H&M and Shein, so it's frustrating to see all the anger directed at resellers who are mostly young women trying to start a business. Both the Vox and Jezebel articles point out that thrifting has always been about people with more money buying used clothes and marking them up, and that you cannot separate capitalism from this fact. An excerpt from the Vox article states that while thrift shopping on its surface might seem like an anti-capitalist alternative to capitalism, the second-hand market is closely linked to the first-hand retail market. There's a lot of rhetoric that makes it seem like thrift shopping exists ethically outside the negative ramifications of capitalism. Sadly, thrift shopping exists in the same messy reality as everything else. And Hazel Sills of Jezebel adds that a popular refrain in discussions of shopping is to cry that there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. But in the case of thrifting, a more accurate statement might be that there is simply no consumption that can be anti-capitalist. While thinking about this supposed problem with blame being placed squarely on women who have found a niche in which to support themselves, I considered the suggestion that disadvantaged people in low-income communities were being screwed out of great finds like 90s-era Hilfiger or low-rise jeans or whatever, and it just didn't track for me. It felt contrived. I thought, truly marginalized people are not viewed in the same way as middle-class people when it comes to dressing themselves or brand-name clothing. Plus, the industry that drives people's desire in the first place to own brand-name things doesn't affect the actually poor in the same way. It wasn't adding up, but I couldn't exactly articulate it. Then, Sills said it perfectly in their Jezebel article, explaining that Depop critics clamor around clothes that don't meet the mark of what they consider to be true vintage, taking offense at boxer shorts sold at an increased price. But the transformation of secondhand clothing or anachronistic dress into admired vintage is often a process defined by class and privilege, just like so much of luxury fashion. The secondhand clothing acceptability deemed or celebrated as stylishly vintage on the body of a person well celebrated by the fashion industry, thin, white, affluent, won't necessarily receive the same treatment when worn on those existing in the margins, especially those to whom secondhand stores have always been their main clothing store. It makes sense that theories about thrift store gentrification would alight on a platform like TikTok, where the dances, voices, and music of black and marginalized creators are often divorced from those who started them and positioned as accessories for white teenagers to wear. Sills says perfectly what I didn't know how. Essentially, it doesn't matter if a poor person who exists in the margins of society finds a luxury brand named item at the thrift store because it doesn't have the capacity to elevate that person out of poverty or lift them up in the same way as, say, a thin, white, affluent person. The irony is that when people first hear about the gentrification of thrift stores, a lot of white feminist liberal woke types want to hop on the bandwagon and immediately vilify anyone who appears to be, quote, over shopping these thrift stores and benefiting from reselling on apps like Depot while themselves missing the mark. Instead of blaming fast fashion or capitalism, many choose to simply blame other women who are just trying to survive. As iterated by the Vox article, it's easier to point fingers at visible, seemingly well-off people who have the means to go to thrift stores and buy up heaps of clothes without batting an eye and ignore the mechanism that makes this a desirable act. TikTok's format, which helps cement the narrative of each user as the main character in their own lives, makes it easy for a certain type of thrifter to be villainized. 
Over the past year, some of this finger-pointing has been lobbed at individual resellers who feel they've received the brunt of backlash that should be directed toward fast fashion corporations, thrift stores that are purposefully raising prices, and Depop for its largely unregulated structure. So, while some sources are airing segments on this supposed economic appropriation, others are bringing a more nuanced conversation to the table, suggesting that it's not individual resellers that are the problem, but corporate greed and the charities that don't really give as much as they say. So what can we do? Well, one thing is we can start deprogramming how we currently look at our clothes. Believe it or not, until about 100 years ago, people just did not throw clothes away. If you knew how to sew, you knew how to freshen up a garment with a new collar or buttons. You could let a piece out or bring it in. And people washed their clothes less, increasing the life cycle of items. I guarantee you probably wash your towels and your jeans too much. In addition, we've been fed the lie for so long that donating clothing is a charitable act and will go to someone in need, thus alleviating us of any remorse and granting us permission to buy a new item. But now that we know the truth that most of our donated clothes will be sold to another country for rags, burned, or stuck in a landfill, perhaps we should think longer about how to repurpose something before we toss it in the donation pile. And when we do buy new clothes, we need to think, will I wear this 30 times or more? And if the answer is no, ask yourself, why am I buying this? You may not wear the suit you bought for your cousin's wedding 30 times, but you likely won't buy a closet full of suits either. We shudder at the thought of spending $20 on socks, but that's because we treat socks as disposable. Which is better, 7 pairs of $20 socks that last you 10 years, or 1,000 pairs of 99 cent socks that last you 6 months? We need to reframe how we think about clothing and what the life cycle of a garment should be. Jezebel's piece on the subject explains that buying secondhand clothes is still buying more clothes, and donating old clothes and then replacing them with new ones reinforces modern ideas about clothing's obsolescence, which is exactly what the fashion industry wants. So, while I say go forth and thrift till your heart's content, turn your closet into an entrepreneurial empire if it's paying your rent. But remember, the most sustainable article of clothing is the one you don't buy. That's my show for this week. I'm Antisocial, and this is the Antisocial Network. If you want even more access to me, Antisocial, follow me on Instagram at the Antisocial Network. To support my content creation dreams and to receive two bonus episodes a month, subscribe to my Patreon for only $5 at patreon.com slash the Antisocial Network. And for a limited time, new patrons will receive Antisocial Network stickers and a top-secret handmade zine made by me, Antisocial. To send me voice memos or to submit your own funny fake ad that I might use in my podcast, download the Anchor app and find my show there. As always, new episodes are available in the free feed every week. See you next Wednesday. Later! But I'm into sociable, yeah!